Okay, right. Uh, I think pretty much everyone has uh, got in and we are recording now as well. So just a, a big welcome uh, to everyone that's joined us uh, this afternoon as well. Thanks very much uh, for that on this session on uh, lifestyle journalism, which we'll go into a bit more detail about in a second. I'll, I'll start off by uh, introducing uh, myself first as well. So my name's uh, Chris Chohan. I'm one of the trustees here at the um, SPA. Um, and I'll now introduce uh, uh, Lily Cantor, who's a freelance uh, uh, lifestyle journalist. And I'll, I'll let you uh, uh, just uh, tell us a bit about yourself, Lily. OK, um, thanks very much. Yes. So um, I'm a, a freelance journalist and I very much cover um, kind of a broad range of what I call money, health and lifestyle. Um, but I started out in the local press kind of way back in the early noughties um worked my way sort of through local newspapers um I had a little bit of a secondary career in academia um and then I came back into journalism um directly into freelancing um about about six years ago um, so yeah, I've been freelancing since then. Um, I'm right for a real range of titles, so kind of newspapers, um, mainly at the moment, um, Metro, Guardian, I've done the old bits for the Telegraph and the Times. Um, I do quite a lot for the South China Morning Post, um, which is a bit random, but I can explain how I ended up writing for them. Um, and I've written for magazines like Vegan Living, Money Wise, and I'm starting to do quite a few things for Trail Running Magazine now as well. So kind of quite an eclectic mix of newspapers online and magazines. And, and we were uh, talking just a second ago about, you know, how broad uh, lifestyle journalism uh, can be as well. And I, I was reading up on it earlier, and one of the quotes, that really stood out for me was uh, uh, the bit that I read where it said that it's one of the most challenging uh, forms of uh, journalism. So I think if you had to explain it to our um, audience, what would you say lifestyle journalism is? Um, I guess I was I was having to think about this, trying to think like exactly what it is. I suppose the way I would view it is it's kind of anything that is outside of work. Um, so but even work can fit into lifestyle journalism. Um, but really, yeah, anything that's kind of to do with our spare time. So, you know, that could be anything from sort of fitness, health, travel, fashion, beauty, um, culture and arts can fall under lifestyle, um, music, entertainment, parenting, um, even real life stories could, could fit under lifestyle journalism. So it's very much... Um, a broad spectrum um, and there are obviously niches within that um, I guess I suppose it's it's viewed as kind of soft journalism in a way so you kind of have your hard news and then everything outside of that is kind of viewed as sort of more feature content that's perhaps softer but that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't cover kind of quite heavy topics sometimes um, so it's yeah it's very broad really um, and like I say, there are kind of lots of niches within it. And some people may, you know, just cover one spectrum. So it might just be food and drink, for example, that might just, you know, that be their specialism with in lifestyle, or it could be music. And within music, it could even be, you know, it could just be guitars. So there are kind of loads of different niches that you can explore within lifestyle journalism, or you can be quite generalist. And I, I'm kind of turn my hand to lots of different things um but I guess I'm kind of building up more of a portfolio around um running in particular because that's kind of my interest um but yeah I, I mean I do a whole range of things really within lifestyle journalism it is it is kind of broad and I suppose that's why it's quite tricky because it's kind of finding where you fit within that kind of broad spectrum and and, and just on that particular kind of like subject and topic there as well, the finding um, uh, where you where you fit. What 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 skills skills are needed for someone to say kind of like go from that broad uh, topic area of lifestyle journalism to something a bit more more niche? You know, like you mentioned things like uh, guitars uh, there, for example, as well. Though, how can they broaden their skill set uh, for that? 
I think really it comes down to um, knowledge of a particular area. So if you want to be kind of the go-to person for that particular niche, then you need to know as much as possible about it. So you kind of, in a way, it needs to be one of your interests, something that you're kind of living and breathing yourself. So if I use running as an example, um, I run a lot. I have my own running group. I coach runners. Um, I subscribe to lots of running magazines. So when I want to pitch to them, I know exactly the type of things they've covered before. I can refer in my pitch, you know, this is um, a follow-up to an article you did in issue 51, but I want to take it um, a slightly different approach and use the style of X article that you covered in issue 67. Um, And really you're giving the impression that you not only understand the topic, but you understand the the publication um, in great detail. So, I would say if you are going to go kind of really niche, you need to understand all the publications in that market and you need to understand the topic area. Um, You need to be very passionate about it. Um, And that's kind of where expertise normally comes from. It's it's from something that you're really kind of absorbed in yourself. Um, And then you you get to know kind of all different angles and also what's not been covered, because if you're reading you know on that topic all the time and you think god i haven't seen an article about x um then you kind of know okay well that that's that's something that maybe i should look into that that's an idea that i can explore so yeah i would say it's very much about follow what you're you're interested in um and be as knowledgeable as you can about that particular subject area and it does quite often come out of a sort of personal passion I suppose for, for a particular thing and again just just listening to what you've had to say there as well the um, um I'm, a, I'm a senior lecturer at university as well the teaching journalism and one of the challenges um we have along with uh, some of our student journalists is is moving from those like you said those hard and heavy uh, news stories or news ideas onto areas of specialism and, and like you said you know the, the the particular passion projects I suppose that that lifestyle journalism encapsulates as well how can they make um, that transition from you know focusing on hard and heavy news to moving into lifestyle journalism you know be it a passion project or otherwise yeah um I suppose I mean it's always about having a hook or an angle um And I know when I started out, um, I was kind of pitching stuff maybe off the back of a a news story. So something that was in the news agenda, but I felt there was um, something more to explore there. Um, So it's kind of taking the news as your starting point for your ideas um, and something that you can go into in in more depth. Um, It's obviously understanding features content because the lifestyle does tend to be more features orientated so having a good grasp of what features look like what kind of angles and hooks are used um and it's obviously just consuming as much content as possible i think one of the things that sometimes people get a bit confused about with lifestyle journalism is they think it's all personal experience um and some of it is but really opinion and comment is a is a niche in itself um and lifestyle is not just writing about your own experience about things although that does happen and I do write some first person pieces and some opinion pieces but on the whole um you know stuff I write it will be based on some new research that's come out um or it could be I've just come across a person that's got a really interesting story to tell. Um, it could be kind of a calendar event, you know, time of the time of the year. Um, it, 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 there's lots of different places really where ideas come from. And I think, I suppose with news, it's more reactionary, isn't it? You're kind of seeing what's happening in the world, whereas with features, you're having to come up with ideas. Um, so it's just about being tuned into what's in the news agenda, but also what conversations people are having. What are people talking about? What are your friends talking about? What kind of things can you see in groups, um, you know, niche groups online? 
Uh, I, I used to write quite a lot for Vegan Living magazine and I would spend a lot of time trawling through vegan Facebook groups um, just to see what are people talking about. Um, and if there was a topic that I thought, oh, that's quite interesting, um, I would go away and research it, see what else had been written about it. And if there wasn't much, then I kind of felt, okay, there's something, there's a story here. So, for example, um, I think the very first piece I did for Vegan Living magazine was on tattoos. And someone had asked the question, is it possible to get a vegan tattoo? Because a lot of the products they use in tattoos um, are fish based. Um, and there's sort of other things like there's a lot of um, beeswax used in, in products and stuff. So someone just asked that question. And I just thought, oh, that's really interesting. I've never actually thought about veganism and tattoos. Um, and so I, I pitched an idea off the back of that because no one had really explored it before, but people were, were asking the question. So again, it's just kind of what questions are people asking and, and it's kind of thinking, right, is there an idea here that I can explore in more detail? Um, but you can also get ideas from, you know, I get ideas from watching documentaries or listening to podcasts. Um, and I might think, you know, oh, this is a really interesting podcast, but I've not seen anything written about this topic. So I wrote a piece on cryptocurrency um, and, and how to avoid getting scammed because I listened to um, a BBC documentary, the, the cryptocurrency queen. Um, and I just thought, again, actually, I've not seen that much. I've seen news stories around this scam, but I haven't actually seen um, sort of advice pieces on how not to get into that situation in the first place. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I get ideas from everywhere and I just basically have a Google Doc where I keep a note of everything. In fact, these days I don't even use that very often. I just I just write stuff down on post-it notes um, every time I get an idea. Or literally, like yesterday, I had an idea um, and I just pitched it straight away. Just kind of got it out of my head into a pitch and out and it, and, and it got commissioned this morning. So sometimes it's, yeah, it's, you have to kind, sometimes you have to act quite quickly on ideas, but loads of different places, loads of different places ideas come from. And, and just, just building on that as well, the so, um, you know, from what you said, you know, it's it's about taking in things around you. And you've talked about uh, documentaries and and podcasts as well. Though I really enjoyed uh, the the Crypto Queen one. Um, unlike you, I'm not quite into the running phase just yet as well. So when I'm out <laughs> and about walking, I had that on uh, BBC Sounds. Other other podcast providers are available, uh, but I did have that one and really enjoyed that. So if we're talking about consuming things around us, having an understanding of things around us and then we can build that into ideas and um, for, for anyone that's starting out uh, in the industry looking to go into lifestyle journalism what's the next stage after they've got those initial ideas yeah I mean I guess it depends on kind of where you're at whether you're still a student or you're looking for jobs um, but I guess my advice would be you you want a home for your story at the end of the day so and it's about building up a portfolio and that could be a portfolio of work um you might be doing work experience and you're expected to come up with ideas or it might be something for your own um student assessments or it might be freelance work which may be paid or unpaid so it, it's it's not just about the idea, but it's also about, right, who is the audience for this particular story and um, which publication represents that audience. There are kind of two ways you can go about it. Um, you can go the way that I tend to go, which is I have an idea and then I find a home for it. Or you can have a publication um, and you can think, right, I really want to write for that publication you look at what they do and then you kind of try and find an idea that, that fits with that publication, which I sometimes do, but it, for me, it tends to be the other way around. So yeah, then it's about mastering how to pitch. Um, and there's obviously a whole kind of knack to how you go about doing that. Um, but that's really about 
sending your idea for a story so by that point it, it needs to be very clear it's not just I want to run write about if I use the example of the one I, I got published this uh, commission this morning so I wanted to do something on um canny cross which is basically running with dogs when you've got a dog attached to you um and I wanted to pitch it to trail running magazine because I felt it fit their audience because it's all about sort of not road running but being outdoors in the fields and kind of that's where you're going to go running with a dog on the whole um so my pitch was very much I looked at the magazines I looked at what they'd done on Canning Cross already um and I wasn't just sending an email saying I'd like to write about Canning Cross I had to have a very specific idea of what I was going to do that was going to be different to what they had already published so I basically referred to the most recent article and I said you know I want to take a different angle on this <clears throat> and I I know um basically I said I I know a canny cross trainer um I would like to go out with her and she's going to train me how to do this and I'm going to write a first person experience piece on like how the hell do you run with a dog like for my you know this woman is training her dog to run an ultra with her which is like 30 miles um so yeah it was it was specifically around doing something I've never done before with someone who's trained to do it and what that experience is like basically um and I so in the pitch I, I explained that but like in a couple of sentences referred to the piece they'd done explained how it's going to be different from that and explained kind of the style it was going to be in reference to another article they they'd done um so I wasn't just saying I want to write about this topic I was I was telling them how I was going to write about it and I I did have like this is the main body and this is like the sidebar I'm going to do where I'm going to list all the the races the kind cross races in 2022 um so you have to get, if you want to get commissioned, you have to learn kind of how to pitch, how to do it very succinctly and how to be very clear that you are selling a whole package, not just, I want to write about this topic. Um, so other times there'll be a much stronger angle um, if it's not a first person piece. Um, it may be you've got, like a real life story so um there's one I did recently which was a, a bit of a kind of more of a I suppose a light-hearted piece um which was about a woman during basically a woman who makes her own reusable toilet paper okay and this is a friend of mine and I always thought, I don't know many people that make that own re reusable toilet paper. There's got to be a story in this. Um, so, you know, the pitch would be, because I because I do write about money quite a lot, you know, woman saves, whatever it is, £500 a year making reusable toilet paper. So you're, again, you're selling kind of a headline rather than I'm going to write about toilet paper. Um, so it's always about thinking about it in terms of a headline and being able to kind of spell out exactly who you're going to be speaking to, what the angle is, are there going to be any images, and doing that in a very succinct way. Um, I mean, I, I do a whole kind of webinar on pitching <laughs> and a whole other webinar on how to actually find the right people in the first place to pitch to. Um, but it's a really good starting point is just getting as much content um, commissioned as possible, whether that's for free sites like the independent, um, the independent. Um, I know Empower they they publish stuff as well. There's there's quite a few um, places now where you can get content um, that is edited um, or pitching it, you know, for paid work. And when I started, I got in contact with a lot of regional magazines. Um, and I started writing for them. Um, they had smaller budgets, but they did have some budget. And I was literally writing about 
um, things like community choirs. Um, I tested out electric bikes for one publication. I wrote about how to set up a book club. Um, I wrote about the rise of indoor rock climbing. Um, so actually local magazines can be quite a good place because they don't tend to get pitched to very often. People kind of forget about them. So that can be a good starting point. It's like actually finding out what magazines are there in your local area and, and they don't necessarily expect you to be someone with years and years of experience. Quite often they take on people who don't have much writing experience at all. Um, so that can be a good starting point as well. And obviously if you've got your own websites and things as well, you, you can be um, putting content on there. But I would discourage you from more kind of blogging type content because um, if you want to build a portfolio as a journalist, you need to have journalistic content out there rather than um, kind of more opinionated content. Um, there's there's so many people doing um, opinion pieces. I think really to stand out, it's it's doing those pieces that involve research and interviews that, that are going to put you in a good position. So that's a really long-winded answer. No, that's okay, because <laughs> I think it covered quite a lot of um, the bases there as well. Though. I think what was really interesting about that was was the steps that I think um, you know people have to take to you know to break into this particular field as well. You know, you you, know, you talked about things like you know maybe you know writing uh, you know free from the offset and then you know pitching you know paid work uh, for example there as well, which I think is kind of like a, a really important. And that was going to be my my next question as well. Though, thinking about it in terms of chronological order, um, in the sense that um, if if you're doing that kind of like that um, you know publishing for free, you know, your ideas, your stories, your content, uh, for example, then you've got those really kind of like rich ideas that you want to build on. Um, you know, for a for a, a student journalist or someone that's graduated or just starting up um, in the profession, what would your advice be in terms of kind of like getting their stories and out the, the stories and ideas out there for um, paid work, be it freelance or contract? Um yeah, so again, it, it, it comes down to, uh, I mean, for freelance, it's pitching. It's just, you've got to just pitch, 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 pitch away. And when I started, I was sending, I mean, my target was like 10 pitches a week. And I might, if I was lucky, get one commissioned. Um, probably in the beginning, one in 20 was getting commissioned. Um, I've got better at pitching and I've got better at identifying who want certain ideas and who's got a budget so there is a lot of trial and error in the beginning and you have to be very resilient you have to be very persistent it's no good saying oh nobody will nobody will commission me it's like yeah that's kind of that is the game you you, you have to just keep plugging away plugging away plugging away improve your ideas improve your pitching try different people um because once you've got your first commission, that will open up so many other doors. And I know my first commission, I was very fortunate, was for The Guardian. Um, but immediately after that was published, I basically got in contact with the editor and said, right, I'd like to do more content for you. What would you like to see from me? What types of stories are you after? How much of a budget do you have? Um, how often should I pitch you? Because I, you know, I don't want to be bugging you. So a lot of it is about building relationships as well. So once you do get something commissioned, um, it's it's keeping that ongoing relationship with an editor. And it's much easier now because you can kind of have Zoom meetings. You could just ask them for a quick like 10 minute meeting um, for, to kind of pick their brains and, and see what things they're looking for. Um, if your staff, I think... Um, I mean, I think one of the things to to kind of bear in mind is you won't get your dream job straight away and you do have to do the groundwork and you do kind of have to work your way up. So it may be that the first job you start off in is not where you want to end up and it's not it's not the thing that you're most interested in. But that doesn't mean you're not going to learn 
masses in the process. Um, you know, I started out working on a weekly newspaper. The great thing about that was I did a bit of everything. So I was doing all the front page splashes, but at the same time, I was, you know, they were like, can you go to this event where you get to drive police cars and fire engines and cranes for the day and just do a piece about that? Um, and then the next minute I was doing like murders and rapes. It was just, you know, you were in village fates. You know it was just everything um so getting into news actually can be a really good stepping stone to getting into features and lifestyle later down the line and it's just kind of showing willing as well because I know my interview for my first job they asked me what I was kind of interested in and at the time I was really into film and film reviews so I brought that up and the editor was like oh that's great we, we've been thinking about doing more film reviews so maybe if, you know if we do offer you the job that's something you you might be interested in doing and so as well as doing all my news when I when I got the job I did start doing sort of reviews for them as well um, and certainly when I was on my next paper um, I again was a general reporter and then I, I became a health reporter um, but every time there was an opportunity to do something for the magazine, whether that was doing an interview or a theatre review or um, film review, whatever it might be, I always volunteered myself for those kind of things. So, you know, sometimes it's just a case of kind of being really willing to do stuff. And it may be on top of your normal workload, um, but you get that experience, you show people you're keen and then you know a position came up at that paper for features editor and I applied for that job and got that job and you know people knew that I'd already done lots of different types of journalism because I volunteered myself for things so again it's just about kind of in some ways just taking your time learning the ropes being able to do everything well um, putting yourself forward for different things um, and, and as you get more experience, you can start, you know, narrowing down your niche or applying for jobs that are more specific. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just not kind of saying, right, you know, I never would have said when I started, you know, I'm going to be a lifestyle journalist. Um, I was always like, I'm just, I want to be a journalist. Um, and I may kind of go in a different direction you know over time your your career changes anyway um so you know don't be too kind of fixated on one thing I'd say as well you need to kind of be able to turn your your hand to lots of different things as well and and it was something that we covered briefly in the introduction uh, to yourself there as well right at the top but but just purely out of curiosity as well you know you talk about you know the the, the primary you know, kind of like he obviously is being a, a journalist as well. Uh, but then what was it that, that got you into the, the lifestyle journalism area in particular? Um, I think, to be honest, it, it was very organic. Um, it was never kind of a plan as such. It was just when I started freelancing, um, I was just kind of, coming up with ideas and the ideas I were coming up were related to what was going on in my life so um I guess in the beginning I wrote a lot of parenting because I actually went freelance um during my second son's uh, maternity leave so all I was like my life was just babies basically babies and small children so and I was having conversations with a lot of parents so I was getting a lot of ideas from that and then I started writing you know the piece I mentioned earlier for the Guardian well that was about nursery fees so it had a money angle but it sort of had a parenting angle as well um so and then I started doing bits for the Telegraph as well um but it was just because like I say that was where I was in my life at that point um and then yeah and to be honest those 
being published in those publications led to other things that I hadn't necessarily planned. So um, I was, I'd wrote a piece about breastfeeding, therefore someone asked me to be an ambassador for some breastfeeding campaign. Next thing I know, I was being asked to go to a conference, a breastfeeding conference. So I did some stories out the back of that. Um, and then I had this story, that was it from the conference that was to do with some research that had been carried out in a few different countries, but, but not the UK. So I couldn't find a home for it in the UK. That's when I started working for the South China Morning Post because the study had one of the, the countries it focused on was China. And I kind of knew someone who knew someone who knew someone that worked there, um, pitched the idea to them um, and they commissioned it. And they basically came back to me and said, have you got anything else? What else, what else have you got? And suddenly I was like, oh, OK, I need to find stories about uh, health and lifestyle in China. OK, <laughs> um, so I kind of built a niche there as well. Um, it's mainly hot. It's a Hong Kong based paper. It's English language. So. I again I do a lot of health and fitness stuff for them um but again that that was just kind of something that happened so because I'm freelance it, it it's not really that mapped out it's kind of just one thing leads to another um one thing I would say though is kind of a bit of a tip is um whenever you're interviewing someone um that is a possible connection to something else to, to always kind of leap on that so I remember I did a story for the metro about um vegan diets and were vegan diets more expensive than um meat diets um and one of the people I interviewed was the editor of vegan living magazine um who had found through a facebook group um, and I interviewed her about this piece. And then at the end, I said, oh, so you're the editor of Vegan Living. Do you take commissions? What kind of stuff are you looking for? And that's how I started writing for Vegan Living magazine. Um, so whenever I speak to any journalists or editors, because they quite often want to be quoted in stories that you're doing, I always use that as an opportunity to say, you know, what kind of stories are you looking for? Um, so it's about kind of constantly networking and always taking those opportunities. And I'll, I'll make this my last question before I actually open it up uh, uh, to everyone that's in the in the chat here as well, though. And I suppose the, the, the last question that I've got is, is that what is the what is the lifestyle journalism piece of work uh, that, that you're most kind of like proud of or, or your favourite uh, from the pieces that you've done? And oh. then, and then, 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 secondly, what was what was the one that you thought was a cracking idea? This is going to make for a fantastic uh, pitch and a story that didn't quite make it, even though you thought otherwise. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there is a story I'm I am quite proud of, although some people are quite cynical about it. Um, which was this um, breastfeeding story? Um, let me see if I can find. Yeah, it, it did for the Telegraph called Meet the Woman Trying to Cure Cancer Through Breast Milk. Um, and uh, I think this was an exclusive that I got. So that that for me um, was one of the reasons why I was quite proud of it. And also it got picked up by a lot of publications. But actually the science behind the story, it's not as kind of pie in the sky as it sounds. It is, you know, is it is a genuine um, kind of research into this this protein in breast milk that does um, kill cancer cells. And um, I'm kind of keeping my eye on this story because it's research just takes so long and it and it's they're still in clinical trial stages at the moment. Um, but yeah, that story I just think because the that all came from being invited to this conference um meeting the woman that was doing the research um and doing the interview with her and I tried I remember when I was writing the intro I, I tr because when I pitched it I pitched it about the woman not about the actual research 
because I felt that the research itself to some people seemed a little bit too obscure um, and she's based in Sweden as well so there wasn't like a strong UK angle I thought if I pitch this as about the woman and for the fact that she's not been taken seriously by the scientific community and she's been doing this research for decades um, and the reason she's not been taken seriously is not because her research is bogus it's just because she's come from a different sector of science um to the ones that normally get all the like big funds and it's all very political basically the reason why so I, it was more about her struggle to kind of get recognition um and like I say that got picked up by a lot of other publications so I and that was quite early on um in my freelance career so that's kind of the one that always comes to mind because I had to kind of think a little bit out the side of the box in terms of getting that picked up and I did have to pitch quite a lot to get that and it was one of the ones that I knew I knew once it was out there everyone would start copying it and it would end up everywhere but I was pitching and pitching and pitching before it got picked up um and my gut instinct was right on that one um so that's yeah that's one of the ones that comes to mind there's another one that I've been trying for years <laughs> to get somewhere with which I've never had um which is to do with baby formula um and advertising basically false advertising around baby formula um which again came came up out of a conference um which I guess is slightly more of a con health consumer story than necessarily kind of lifestyle um but there's kind of quite a big investigation behind it and I've never been able to find the right home for it I've had editors say they're really interested but it doesn't fit their it doesn't fit health it doesn't fit money um it kind of it's in between it's not quite science so that's one I've yeah that's one I've been trying to to find a home for and it's kind of on the back burner um, at the moment. Brilliant, right, well, thanks very much uh, uh, for that, Lily. Um, what I'm gonna do is, like I said, I'm just mindful of, well, two things, time and, and the fact that we've got quite a fair few people in here as well. So I think um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it up for um, any questions uh, that people may have as well. Um, you know, so we're quite happy for them to uh, take it away. You can do it one of uh, two ways if you want as well, that we can either um, uh, just type it into the chat, I can uh, read it out, or you can open up your um, uh, camera and mic and just ask Lily direct, really don't mind. I will say as well, just while I was preparing to think, in terms of like stuff, I suppose I've been really not necessarily, not necessarily proud of, but maybe quite excited or a little bit, um, yeah, kind of thrilled to do. With, as I mean, obviously I've done lots of different things, but when I was when I was staff reporter, um, I used to do quite a lot of travel um reviewing and and I also went to Bosnia with the army um which again was kind of more of a I guess more of a news more of a hard news but it's when I was features editor and I wrote a series of features around what the British army was doing out in Bosnia but that was a really interesting experience um, and also I used to kind of do a lot of interviews um, and at the time I was a massive, this shows my age, Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, fan and I got to interview um, Tony Head who was known as Anthony Stewart Head who was, who was Giles in Buffy. Oh my god that was just brilliant <laughs> and he was so lovely, absolutely lovely. Um, so that was really good and also um, I went to the Dark Knight press launch at the Dorchester Her Hotel in London and I was a massive Christian Bale fan at the time and he was there um, as were quite a lot of the cast actually. That, that was really good. So if you get into the kind of review side of it, um, you know, you kind of get into more of the, 
I suppose, celebrity side and entertainment, which does fall under lifestyle journalism as well. So that that can be quite exciting. I wouldn't want to do that all the time. I, for me, it's a little bit superficial, but it is quite fun um, to do that kind of every now and then to do those interviews and um, kind of meet those people and see what they re- what they're really like. Yeah, big uh, Batman Begins, Dark Knight fan as well. Um, <laughs> envious. Um, and, and I suppose that kind of like, you know, leads on to the next bit as well. So like, you know, there's a there's a number of things that you can do around um, lifestyle journalism. We, we've talked about, you know, you know, a sense of kind of like a beginning, middle and end, the journey uh, to it all as well. So if you had, you know, kind of like, um, you know, some some tips and advice you know, for um, any student journalists that we've got here, or like I said, you know, early anyone that's kind of like starting out in the industry, what would you kind of like, you know, three to five bits of, a key bits of advice be for them? Yeah, I think, um, I think I would say, don't get too bogged down on, I want to work in X, kind of, you know, I want to work as a fashion journalist. Um just try your hand at everything um, and don't kind of pigeonhole yourself from the beginning because you, you know, you'll get going into a broader job, like a general features or reporter job. You'll just get to try so many different things. Um, and that can be really a really good training ground as well. Um, you know, just for learning the basics of like, structuring a story and interviewing and finding contacts honing your media law just kind of getting the basics right you've got to kind of walk before you can run I guess um so I would yeah I would say like don't get too too hooked on like one thing from the from the beginning because you may limit yourself by doing that Um, I'd also say that it's not about lifestyle journalism is not about you and I think again I know I've mentioned a couple of first person pieces that I've done and that that is part of it but the vast majority of stuff I do is is not first person and actually um, most of the time people don't care about you or your experience Um, you know unless you're a big name columnist then it's not really relevant. I know there are lots of platforms that that do ask for that type of thing, but there's only so many times you can write about an experience that you've had. Um, So try and kind of try and see it as something that is, it's not about, about you and your experience. It's, it's about other people and it may be about communities that you know nothing about it, you know, it may be about older people or people from a different background or in a different country. Um, and that's what makes it so interesting. Um, so try not to kind of get too caught up in your own sort of inner circle, I suppose. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, ideas is just, you, you need to be good at coming up with ideas and, and, and making a note of them because um, it may be that you've got an idea of something but now is not quite the right time for it for for a number of reasons but if you've just got a log of ideas then you can kind of go back to them there might suddenly be you know a big news story or a celebrity does something and then suddenly that idea you had um everybody wants it that's what happened with that reusable toilet paper story (laughs) funnily enough is I had that for probably a year um and, and no one was interested. Suddenly the pandemic, there was a shortage of toilet paper and there was demand <laughs> for a story about someone making their own toilet paper. Um, so, and, and funnily enough, um, that was originally written for The Sun, but Lad Bible just bought it, um, bought a license to reuse it from me a couple of weeks ago, like a year after I wrote the story. I don't know why, um, but certain stories do get recycled as well um but yeah keep a note of ideas and just be really tuned in to what people are are talking about those would be my top three i think 
Yeah, I think those are all kind of like, you know, quite um, the key points there as well, Don. I think just probably just the last one, just before I wrap up, and this is purely a, an in actually as a as a journalism, well, as, as part of journalism uh, lecturer. One of the things that we do is uh, news days in which we um, give our students a number of beats. And obviously the conversation that we've just had, I definitely want to introduce a, a, a lifestyle uh, beat as, as part of the, the themes that we already have, because I know that some of our students aren't particularly keen on that hard news, you know, the, the top line of whatever news story it might be as well. Yeah. Now, what would your advice be in terms of kind of like a, a buy-in for the students for that as well, that without making it too broad, how could we introduce a lifestyle beat? I think you would have to have um, niches within it. So you'd maybe have um like health and well-being as one maybe um let me think sort of music and entertainment maybe uh fashion and beauty and then maybe like culture and arts I would break it up into different niches within because life's are so broad um break it into different niches and then get students to kind of decide which one they want to do um, and maybe do it like that because yeah I mean I don't I, there aren't when, when when people say lifestyle journalists it's like I say it's very broad quite often people will say you know I'm a journalist specializing in you know health and well-being or even you know I specialize in guitar I know I know a freelance journalist and his specialism is basically guitars and he writes for lots of guitar magazines so he'll call himself a music journalist but actually his specialism is, is guitar music um so you know even like travel you could have a specialism it could be like a particular part of the world for example um but yeah I think having like having different niches within lifestyle journalism and 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 getting people to sign up for different areas that might be one way to do it well i've i've written that down anyway that's for sure as well but so I'll, <laughs> what i have to do is i'll have to give you an update say maybe the beginning of the next academic year and just let yeah, you know yeah. um, um how it's going as well so i think um you know just on behalf of the spa as well i think i'll just mindful of time as well to just just round it off there and just say a big thank you as well so uh, thank you very much lily for the you know, for the information there on lifestyle there, journalism there as well, much appreciated. Uh, just a, um, a, a quick bit of information for um, everyone just before they, they head off as well. They're coming up um, next in, in our rooms as well. So in room one, we've got uh, tackling disinformation in the media uh, with the BBC's uh, uh, Mariana Spring. Um, and we've got the links uh, just coming up on the group in the group chat there as well in room two we've got a session where you can come and ask any question about media law that's with our um, uh, expert david banks and if i just scroll down yep we've just posted both of the links uh, there for you as well so yeah i think all this uh, to say again once again Lee, is uh, uh, thanks very much thank you for your time no problem um if i if i may as well just have a quick little plug um i yep. some people may or may not know that i'm one half of freelancing for journalists so we have a, a podcast series but we also do run um webinars throughout the year um if you just look at freelancingforjournalists.com um you'll see our program of events there because we do do a lot on pitching and finding work um as well as other things we've got sessions on tiktok coming up as well so if you're interested have a look um have a look on our website we'll do i think I'll definitely be coming along to that as well. I'll be in touch as well, for sure, especially on uh, TikTok as well. For sure. Brilliant. Right then. Well, uh, thank you very much once again. And then thank you to everyone that joined us as well.